This lecture is going to kick off our unit on health behaviors by looking at some definitions and describing the scope of the problem of why health behaviors are such a critical issue for us to address in this course. It's an important uh, article that is assigned for your reading this week by uh, Dr. Steven Schroeder, who is a doctor uh, out of uh, the University of San Francisco College of Medicine. Uh, he wrote this article called, We Can Do Better Improving the Health of the American People. I want to read you the very first line of this paper. Dr. Schroeder writes, The United States spends more on health care than any other nation in the world, yet it ranks poorly on nearly every measure of health status. How can this be? What explains this apparent paradox? Dr. Schrader goes on in the paper to point out that uh, health care itself has a relatively small impact on life expectancy and quality of life. Certainly it is a part of the picture, but in terms of what determines premature death and what determines life expectancy, uh, it's a relatively small player. You see in this figure from the article only about 10% of um, premature death is attributable to health care or the lack of health care for some folks. Much bigger contributions come from things like social circumstances and genetic predisposition, which accounts for 30%. But the biggest slice of uh, contributions to premature death is what he refers to as behavioral patterns, the daily habits that people engage in that either protect their health or put them at risk for health problems and premature death. This highlights that uh, health behaviors and health habits are really and must be a priority for us to try to address uh, improved health and um, make an impact on uh, uh, limiting premature death. So what are some of the big contributors to premature death and those what kinds of habits are the biggies? Well, you might be able to guess. We might not need this chart to tell us, but this chart certainly uh, highlights some of the main things. Um, the two biggies are obesity and inactivity, two things that are inextricably linked together, and smoking. Uh, Schrader makes the case, and he is certainly right, that we've made great inroads on smoking. We have taken smoking prevalence from about 57% down to below 25% in most parts of the country. That's a huge improvement over the last 40 to 50 years. Um, but still, smoking is a significant contributor to, contributor to premature death and ill health among the American public. You notice that solid bar about in the middle of the bar for smoking there. What that represents is the number of people below that, almost 200,000 per year, who die prematurely from smoking, who have mental health issues. You may recall from one of our interviews with experts a few years ago, Elizabeth Black. Uh, she mentioned that people with mental health issues, chronic mental health issues, die on average 25 years younger than the average American uh, uh, person in the public. Um, a large part of that is due to smoking. Smoking is highly prevalent among uh, populations who struggle with mental illness, and it has a big contributor to premature death in those populations. So as you can see in this figure, there's a number of things, including things like alcohol is another biggie, uh, sexual behavior, um, accidents in motor vehicles, those sorts of things. But obesity and inactivity and smoking are two huge behavioral contributors uh, to ill health and health costs in the United States. So when we focus on health behavior, we probably should start off a bit with some definitions. We define broadly, your textbook def defines health behavior as any activity people perform to maintain or improve their health. We might want to broaden that definition a little bit, uh, consistent with our definition of health for this course, uh, of inclusive of optimal wellness on one end, all the way to uh, illness on the other end. We might define health behavior as any activity that people perform that measurably impacts their health outcomes, whether those be negative outcomes like illness and disease, or positive outcomes such as moving towards optimal wellness. We can break health behaviors down lots of different ways. One general way we can break it down is looking at what we consider pro-health versus risky health behaviors. Pro-health behaviors enhance wellness and reduce the risk of future illness. Risky health behaviors, uh, what I might call health risk behaviors in the lectures, diminish wellness and increase the risk for illness. 
We can further break down those categories into lots of smaller categories. If we look at pro-health behaviors, there's lots of ways to categorize pro-health behaviors. We might think of some behaviors as what we call precautionary behaviors. These are pro-health behaviors that are intended to detect illness early when it can most easily be managed. Things like uh, breast or testicular self-examinations for cancer are good examples of precautionary behaviors. Other kinds of screenings folks might do, checking your blood pressure, checking for cholesterol, even the health risk assessment like we did earlier in this class are good examples of precautionary behaviors that are good to repeat on an annual basis or so. Here at OSU, as an employee of OSU, uh, as part of our health insurance program, uh, we are expected to go get a wellness checkup where we get our things like cholesterol and blood pressure checked. We also complete a health risk assessment and we complete counseling with a nurse practitioner. If we do that as employees of OSU, we actually get $250 deducted off of our or removed from our deductible for that year. So there's a big incentive to do that because these kinds of precautionary behaviors prevent illness and disease, detect them early, when treatments can be more effective and perhaps cheaper. So the insurance companies even see there's an advantage to motivating these kinds of precautionary behaviors. Another common precautionary behavior is regular contact with your health professional. Whether you have regular checkups with a doctor, you visit the optometrist or the dentist, uh, those are good examples of precautionary as well. We might also think of other kinds of pro-health behaviors, what we call wellness behaviors. These are behaviors that are intended to promote wellness, things like fitness, vitality, or longevity. Things like eating a balanced, low-calorie diet that's rich in fresh fruits and vegetables, good wellness behavior. Uh, avoiding altogether or limiting intoxicating substances, good wellness behavior. Or perhaps engaging in regular physical activity of a moderate intensity is another example. We can also think of pro-health behaviors called preventive behaviors. These are the kinds of behaviors that are intended to prevent specific illnesses or predictable injuries. These are typically not daily habits, but they typically involve uh, things that might be uh, periodic, discrete decisions to avoid certain risks um, or to um, uh, prevent certain illnesses. Things like engaging in safer sex practices, uh, ranging from uh, abstinence to monogamy uh, to using condoms. Uh, safe food handling procedures, another kind of preventive behavior, uh, making sure that you're keeping places where you prepare food clean, not mixing utensils that you use with uh, meat that may carry bacteria with fresh vegetables that may not be uh, cooked to adequate temperatures. Uh, vaccinations are another good example of preventive behaviors where you may engage in those only once or twice in your life in order to prevent certain predictable illnesses over time. Uh, daily dental care or sunscreen use are closer to daily habits where you might be doing things every day, again, to put off predictable illnesses or injuries um, like dental cavities or gum disease or perhaps uh, sunburns or even skin cancer. Another type of pro-health behavior is what we call safety behaviors. These are things that are intended primarily to prevent accidental death or injuries. This could include things like wearing seat belts in your car, uh, having uh, discipline to not text in your car, another good contemporary safety behavior, or perhaps selecting safer equipment. When you go shopping for a vehicle, do you look for safety features? When you shop for uh, tools or appliances for your home? Are you looking for safety as one of the features? That would be an example of a safety behavior. And we can also think of treatment behaviors, also known as treatment adherence, as another kind of pro-health behavior. So for example, seeking out treatment when necessary, when people have certain symptoms. Uh, we've been going through a pretty nasty cold and flu season. And there was a lot of advice given out to uh, folks all over the, the state and certainly here at OSU that when you had certain kinds of symptoms, a headache and a fever, seek treatment early because the earlier treatment starts, the more effective it could be. Uh, certainly for people who seek out health care, complying with that medical advice and complying with all instructions are another example of treatment behaviors. Uh, for example, taking bi antibiotics. We know this is kind of an epidemic problem in the U.S., where many, many people are prescribed antibiotics. Some would argue that we overprescribe antibiotics, but patients typically don't take them as prescribed. They stop taking them before the full dose is out. And that creates a risk for developing 
um, treatment resistant bugs, uh, what are called superbugs, that might not be as responsive to antibiotics in the future and could put us all at risk. So my question for you, did you take all of your last antibiotic? Sometimes that's difficult to do because sometimes uh, you feel well, yet you still have antibiotics to take. It's easy to forget or to think that it's unnecessary. Uh, sometimes they're not all that pleasant to take. They may have unpleasant side effects or taste, and that makes it difficult to maintain as well. We'll talk about treatment adherence behaviors later in the class when we look at uh, behavior in the context of the healthcare system. And uh, lastly, we can look at risky health behaviors. These are the kinds of things that put people at risk for future illness or disease. Things under this category include things like sedentary lifestyle, being a couch potato, lacking any kind of regular movement or physical activity, eating unhealthy or unbalanced diet, either too many calories, uh, excessive consumption of fats, especially saturated fats, or lacking fresh fruits and vegetables and the vitamins and fiber and good things that come with uh, that diet. Risk health behaviors also include excessive use of substances that could include abuse or dependence, things like smoking tobacco, misuse of alcohol or other illicit drugs, uh, or a, a growing problem in the U.S., prescription drug abuse. We'll talk about substance use behaviors in some more detail in a later lecture. Now, these health risk behaviors can have a huge impact on life expectancy and premature death. Uh, this figure from an article in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2007 tried to calculate out exactly what is the impact on um, premature death for these different things. If you look at the longest bar across the bottom there, what you see is in, a, in our, our x-axis is the probability of survival to age 90. If somebody has none of the behaviors on the left-hand side, they're not sedentary, they don't have high blood pressure uh, or obesity, they don't smoke, um, if they don't have any of those risk factors, they have a greater than 50% chance of living to 90 years or longer. That's really something else for somebody who's... Um, uh, that's quite an impact. But you notice as you go up the scale there, looking at the individual impacts of being sedentary, high blood pressure, um, having obesity or diabetes or smoking, each of those alone have a pretty significant impact. Um, smoking the greatest of the single risk factors. But then if you go further to the top of the figure where you see those risk factors combined, you really see how these things uh, can add up. And sadly, these risk factors typically do co-vary. They tend to co-occur. They rarely occur simply in isolation. So we're more likely to find people who have multiple risk behaviors rather than only a single risk behavior and are healthy in their behavior in every other way. So this is a huge impact. You notice at the very top there, if somebody has all five adverse factors, so they're sedentary, they have high blood pressure, they have obesity and diabetes, and they smoke, those individuals have almost no shot of making it to 90 years. Now I know everybody can say, well, I know somebody, my aunt, my grandma, and certainly that's true, that there are people who just perhaps have uh, the genetic good fortune or good access to health care um, that allows them to do all kinds of risky things and still make it. But that doesn't undermine this kind of data that demonstrates that these risk factors, both singly and in combination, have a tremendous impact on our life expectancy and rates of premature death. One relatively new risk factor that folks have been paying a lot more attention to lately is simply, simply the act of sitting too much. There's a whole lot of literature coming out right now on what they're calling sedentary syndrome or sitting disease that documents that independent of lots of other risk factors, if you sit too much, particularly for more than eight hours in a day, you are putting your health at great risk. Some are equating sitting for eight or more hours in a day in total, and that includes all the time you spend during the day, sitting in class, sitting in your car driving, sitting at home during dinner. Eight or more hours in a day, they're equating as approximately equivalent to being a pack-a-day cigarette smoker in terms of its impact on your life expectancy. That's incredible, and so there's a lot of emphasis right now in trying to get people simply on their feet more, uh, moving a little bit more, and we may talk more about that throughout the class. You might notice that uh, in our weekly update videos, I'm uh, standing. Uh, I'm standing recording this video because I actually stand at my desk most of the time every day. 
I've even got a treadmill I can pull out and walk a little bit on while I work if I want to. But I have a desk that goes up and down with me, and I can stand and do my work, including recording this lecture right now. So the last slide I want to show you shows you a little bit of how this impacts us right here at home. This figure right here shows the South Central United States broke out by counties. In terms of particular risk factors of what percent of the population is physically inactive, is not active enough, and is putting their health at risk. The darker colors indicate a higher percentage. Notice right in the middle of that figure, you can almost see the perfect outline of the state of Oklahoma. We are here in Oklahoma really inactive as a general population. Now here at OSU, we're a bit of a shining example that's pushing back against that trend. Um, OSU is a, by and large, a quite active campus, and Stillwater is a fairly active community. You'll notice Payne County there in the middle of Oklahoma is one of the best counties in all of Oklahoma. But notice how even the neighboring counties in Texas, Kansas, and Arkansas largely do better than Oklahoma in activity. We'll talk more later in the class about why that might be, but I just wanted to highlight that um, these aren't just abstract issues. These are issues that are impacting the health and well-being of the people we care about and love the most, our families and fellow Oklahomans. So that concludes our uh, introduction to health behaviors. In our next lecture, we will be looking at uh, some measurement issues.